for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, tonight, today is June the 17th, 2020, and uh, normally we would have Bible study on tonight. Uh, we would have men's classes. My wife, Judy, teaches the ladies' class. Um, also, we have uh, young adult classes and uh, student classes and children's classes all the way down to toddlers. But uh, until we get all of this uh, settled, we won't be having our Wednesday night services because that's what we have is our uh, individual classes. Tonight we're going to continue in our study of the book of Revelation and we encourage you to go ahead and be turning there in chapter 1 of Revelation beginning tonight in verse 7. I'll probably read the first six verses to give the context but, uh, but we'll begin our study in verse 7 after uh, last week we finished verse 6. Remember about our Sunday services. Uh, we uh, are having our Sunday services at 9.30 Sunday morning and also at 11.15. Uh, I'm also doing the same sermon I'm doing in both of those services at 8 o'clock that morning and you can watch it anytime that day. I doubt if too many will get up at 8 o'clock to watch it, but it'll be the same sermon that I'll be preaching at the 9.30 and 11, uh, 15 service. We, but we really want to encourage each and every one of you to come and be with us uh, in our assembly, in our church, uh, in our church building. I think it's so vitally important that we gather together. In fact, that's what the word assembly means. It means to get together. Our church means assembly. And we are to come together. And the Bible tells us we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner or custom of some is. And so I encourage you to come and be with us. It's time to get back in church. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's time that we just uh, started uh, doing what we're supposed to be doing. We cannot continue living lives in fear. And I know the media, the government, it seems like everybody's wanting to dump fear on you. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, uh, the love of Christ can disperse all that fear. We put our trust and faith in him. We're to walk by faith and not by fear. And so I just encourage you to get back in church as soon as possible. And I pray uh, for our uh, national leaders, for our president, the Congress, and all of those that seem like all they ever do is fuss and fight against, against one another. But we need to pray for unity. We need to pray for peace. We need to pray for return of law and order in our land. Uh, I think it's, um, it's shocking, really, what's going on in our world today. And we as Christians need to take a stand and stand up for what's right. We, re we need to return to a good law and order. And I know uh, not uh, everyone that's in the law enforcement does right. And I know since many of them have done some horrible things and they need to be punished. They need to be... Uh, uh, go to jail or whatever uh, as a result of their actions. Uh, but at the same time, we can't throw out the, the whole police department for the sake of a few. And so we need to pray for our land and pray for some uh, people in our land to have some sense about them and recognize that we need to get back uh, to law and order. Remember what Jesus said, that in the last days, lawlessness would abound. And as a result, the love of many would wax cold. And uh, just remind you, that's where we are today. And I'm afraid if we continue, as, as God's people continue to stay at home and fail to come out to the house of the Lord and fail to assemble together and work together for the cause and ministry of Christ, what's going to happen is our love's going to wax cold. And we're going to become indifferent to all the stuff that's going on in our world. Remember the church in Revelation, the last church mentioned is the church of the Laodiceans. And God said, Jesus said, he spew them out of his mouth because they were cold. They was neither hot nor warm and he was going to spew them out of his mouth. So I, I don't want to be a part of that church. Uh, and I don't think you do either. So let's get back in church. Let's get back serving the Lord because... Uh, uh, we see that the time is short, and we need to be busy about the Lord's work. Enough preaching, I guess, for right now. Um, also, I wanted to just mention again, 
Uh, if you would like to give to Cedar Grove Baptist Church and the ministry here, uh, we encourage you to go uh, on, uh, fa or on Facebook Live. Uh, you can uh, watch these uh, programs, but uh, your gifts you can give either on uh, Cedar Grove Baptist, www.cedargrovebaptist.com, uh, and click on the online giving there, or you can send your gift to Cedar Grove Baptist Church, 1289 Cedar Road, Stamping Ground, Kentucky, 40324. Uh, or you can come to church, and we put, uh, we're not passing the offering plate around as we normally did, but we are placing them by the entrances and exit doors, and so as you come or as you go, uh, you can drop in your offering into the offering plate. Remember, the tithe is the Lord's. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's the Lord's, and so we need to be faithful in that. Now, uh, let's look in Revelation chapter 1 and I think it's very important for us to look at some things here and I pray that uh, I just want to uh, that it would be uh, meaningful to you and that you would not only learn some of, uh, of God's word but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and that's what I want to emphasize as we study this book uh, I, I'm not uh, emphasizing the Antichrist or all the stuff that's going on or uh, all those things that's uh, later on in this book. We need to emphasize and lift up and magnify the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you. want to thank you for the opportunity to share your word it's our prayer that your word would go forth in power and in demonstration of your spirit, that you'd quicken hearts and minds to receive, and that you would receive honor and glory that's due your holy name tonight. And we give you thanks for it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to begin back in verse 1, and we'll read down through, uh, through verse 7, if you'll follow along with me. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things which he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us kings and priests to his uh, God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they which pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I want to just uh, take a moment and look at this passage there in verse 7 for a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this passage is referring to the second coming of Christ. Behold, he is coming. Uh, and it's not talking about, uh, it's a second phase of his second coming. Uh, the second coming takes, part in two, uh, takes place in two different phases. First, he's coming for his saints, what we call the rapture. You will not find the word rapture in the Bible, but you do find where we're called up to meet him in the air, and that's what rapture means. And so first coming is for his saints, and then later he comes with his saints to rule and reign and pour out his wrath upon this world. Now, uh, as I said, rapture, the word, and nor the uh, event, is necessar not necessarily in the book of Revelation. 
Uh, but what we do have, it is allured to in the book of Revelation. And we need to uh, be aware of that. And we'll look at that when we come, uh, come to that point. But this is the fulfillment. Behold, he comes. Uh, and it says, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 says this. I will, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for his firstborn. They is referring to the Jews. Uh, shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Uh, and Zechariah 13, 6 goes on to say, uh, what are these wounds? The people ask him, what are these wounds between your arms? Uh, then he will answer those which I have, uh, I was wounded in the house of my friends. Notice here he says, every eye will see him. Now some people say, well, how in the world can that be? How can everybody on earth see him? I believe he's talking about all the Jews and the Gentiles and the nations and the people. But today is the first time in history that something can happen and have an event on the other side of the world and simultaneously be seen here, where we are, through the internet, TV, all the nations shall wail or mourn because of him. Zechariah said again in Zechariah 12, 9, the verse before what I just read to you, it will, it will, <clears throat> excuse me, it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And today we see what's going on in the world. We see um, uh, uh, Russia strategically placing themselves there in Syria and around those countries. And we see what's going on in the whole world, it seems to, to uh, condemn uh, Israel about every turn you turn. Only the United States and, uh, and one or two other countries in the world have uh, 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 supported and encouraged and uh, also recognized Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish people. And he goes on to say in verse 11 of Zechariah 12, and in that day, there should be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad Remnant in the plain of Megiddo. And they shall mourn every family by itself, and the family shall that remain every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. In other words, there's going to be great mourning when they see him coming and, and realize that he's the king of kings, and he was the Christ that they had rejected. Now notice verse 8. Notice verse 8, he says, And I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. He who, uh, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Here is the first division of, of the book. Uh, these are the things which John had seen. These are the things that he had seen. And the first division of the book, after inter in the introduction and the salutation and then the announcement that Christ is coming, he's Alpha and Omega, the A and the Z, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the only man in, in uh, the whole uh, universe that hears and knows every language and every dialect there is on earth. That's good to know because we can pray to him in whatever language we want to pray to him in, and he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know that he will answer us. This is he who is and who was and who is to come. Notice, the Almighty, the Almighty, same as in verse 4. Uh, as John described the Father as the Almighty and the Almighty, the all-powerful one. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he, he's talking about all authority. Jesus said that authority is given to him in all heaven and in all the earth. Eight times is uh, the word Almighty is used in the book of Revelation, referring to God and Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Almighty God, 
the all-sufficient one, the beginning and the end. Almighty means the all-sufficient one. Everything we need, we find in Jesus. You're complete in him. Notice the vision that John says, I saw in verse nine. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice here, I, John, uh, John, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who wrote the gospel of John, the way of salvation. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the living out of our salvation. And he wrote the book of Revelation, the result of our salvation. In the book of John, Jesus was portrayed as the prophet, the prophet who came. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he is portrayed as our priest. If we ask anything according to his will, who we know he hears us, and if we know he hears us, we know we have the petitions we desire of him. And in Revelation, he's the coming king. Uh, his name is mentioned five times in this book. I, John. John uh, was the obtainer of God's great grace. Isn't it wonderful when somebody says uh, that they've obtained his grace and they don't get cold over it? John here is riding up in his 90s, and yet he's still excited about the king that's coming. I, John, you can compare that with that, what Daniel said. I, Daniel, in uh, three different times in his prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, 9, and 10, I, Daniel. Here he says, I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation. He's not talking about the great tribulation, but here, <clears throat> here he is talking about this time in history. Uh, the re, uh, the uh, Christians are uh, in, in, uh, in that time were being persecuted by the Romans. He's talking about this time in history. Uh, Jesus told us in this world, you will have tribulation. And as a result, G, uh, John was vanquished to the Isle of Patmos. He was uh, uh, vanquished there. Uh, the Isle uh, of Patmos was a rocky island in the Aegean Sea, uh, about 30 miles off the coast of uh, Asia Minor. It was opposite the city of, uh, of uh, Ephesus, and John, where John had been the pastor for some years, uh, and now he has been vanquished uh, to the Isle of Patmos. Why? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice, tribulation and trials uh, come before the kingdom. Uh, the Christian life is not uh, an easy life. Uh, if you're really living for Jesus, you're really going to have some trouble in this life because we weren't made for this world. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 22, it says this, Strengthen the souls of the disciples, accord, uh, 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 exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulation enter the kingdom of God. To the people at Thessal uh, Thessalonica, Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. The way of a Christian is not necessarily easy, but the way of the Christian has great rewards. And you will never regret one day you serve Christ, not one day. Notice verse 10 in our text. Verse 10 says, and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. And verse 11 says saying and goes on with the, what he said. But notice this verse, verse 10, first of all. And he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. When I ask you, where are you on the Lord's day? 
I, I think so many people today, uh, we have taken the Lord's day and just made it another day of the week. Uh, your only day off will give all kinds of excuses. Some will say that the, uh, uh, some people uh, in, in the theologians say, well, he was carried along by the Holy Spirit on the Lord's day. That was the day of the week or, or unto the Lord's day. That is the coming of the Lord. And, and they have different interpretations, but, uh, but uh, I'm just going to take it for what it says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I want to ask you, uh, where are do you where are you going to be on the Lord's day? You going to be out fishing? You going to be working, sleeping? What where are you going to be on the Lord's day? Listen, we're to come to the house of the Lord and be in the spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, what are you going to do on the Lord's day? Where are you? Where will you be found? Are you preoccupied with maybe anger against someone? Are you preoccupied with such things as what are we going to have for dinner or the sports games today, the whatever it may be, baseball, basketball, some kind of sport event you want to go to or watch on TV. Is it you're preoccupied with your work? And so you can say, well, God understands. I've got to work. And, and, and when we put off the Lord's day, we're told not to forsake our assembling of ourselves together. And so uh, whatever it may be, we need to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, how uh, that we need to be in the house of the Lord. Notice what he said. He said he heard a voice as of a trumpet. And he said, well, what was that kind of voice was that? I, I think if, if you know anything about a trumpet, it's loud, it's clear, and it's plain. You know it's a trumpet when you hear a trumpet. Notice verse 11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Here, he is revealing himself uh, to us as the true and living God and make known, making known his commandments, his instructions to his people in the church. Uh, notice here that he's given instructions for our lives. Write it. Write it down. He's giving us direction for our lives. Send it. And he's giving us sacri uh, our, our specifics about our lives he says uh, he named each and every church. Every church is individual and every church has some specific things that God wants to say to us. The trumpet emphasizes authority. Uh, uh, the trumpet of, of assembly, uh, the trumpet of alarm, the trumpet of war. When it's blown, it's to get your attention. His voice was as a voice of a trumpet. Here he is giving warning and giving instruction to his people, the church. Notice verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about his, the chest with a golden band. When I, then I turned. Seven lampstands, or uh, some uh, the old King James said candlesticks, but lampstands. The candle is a self consuming item. In other words, you light a candle and it burns itself out eventually. But you see, the lampstand is a stand upon which the light is to, to go and fill the room. The, the candle, the lampstand here, he's talking about one that within which is, has a wick and is fed by the oil. And what you got to do is keep that oil. The oil is representative of the Holy Spirit that would cause the light in the church, give us light in this world. So the lampstand is fed by the oil from within. And so we are... Uh, uh, to use, have the Spirit of God that abides in us and through us and, and be lights 
in a lost and dying world. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need light in the daylight. You need light in darkness. And he's talking about in this darkened world, these light stands, these uh, ones that would hold, uh, they're light holders. And that's what the church is to be. The seven, uh, not the seven uh, candlestick that was in the temple where they had one candlestick holder and it had seven lights on it, but these are seven individual light stands. A symbol of the, uh, the uh, lights that we are to shine in this dark and and, and a darkened world that we live in today. Golden lampstands. Golden represents the type of glory. Uh, and the Bible tells us in Ephesians 3.21, to him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Notice where Jesus is. He's in the midst. He's in the midst. And notice his, his robe and his girdle. These are high priestly garments. It was the, uh, the high priest that had the uh, golden girdle and the breastplate of gold. Uh, and, and he's in the midst of the churches as our high priest for the saints of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says, Now this is the main point of these things. We are saying uh, uh, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne, the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. It was the priest's job to keep oil in the lamps and keeps the wicks of the lamps trimmed. He was to keep the light going. Well, now he has made us kings and priests unto God. And it's our job to keep the oil flowing, the Holy Spirit flowing in the church and keeping the wicks trimmed to where they would shine brightly. We are priests unto God. Jesus girded himself for service when he was here uh, in John 13, where he put a towel around himself and washed the disciples' feet. But now we see John falling at his feet. Uh, and and he, he came, first of all, to serve, but he still serves us as our great high priest. He still hears and answers our prayer. Now he stands in glory uh, with power and he's ever living and interceding for the saints of God. He still is serving us. Notice these next few verses. The sevenfold glory of his person. Listen to what he says. Verse 14. His head and hair were white as like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Notice this description of Jesus here. His hair, is, his, his head and his hair was white like wool, as white as snow. Listen to what Daniel said when he saw his vision in Daniel chapter 7. He says, And I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and his hair and his head were like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning flame, a burning fire. It shows his antiquity, his eternal one. And his eyes were flame of fire, John says. This shows his all-knowingness. His eyes will pierce your soul. You will not be able to reply at his judgment one day because his eyes are just and he will, uh, he, uh, he will judge us. 
He reads our hearts. He knows our minds. He will judge all men in righteousness according to the intent of our hearts. And then his feet were like fine brass. Brass burned in furnace, a glowing brass. Judgment that is carried out is what he's referring to. Brass re uh, reminds us of judgment. It was a brassen altar that the sacrifice were offered upon. And that brass represented judgment and the judgment of sin was placed upon that sacrifice. Jesus will tread out the wine press with God's wrath in this world with those feet of judgment upon this world. Revelation 19, 15 says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp a sword uh, that <clears throat> excuse me that with it he should strike the nation and he himself will rule with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God notice verse 15 his voice was the sound of many waters authoritative the sound of thunder remember he says God spoke from heaven, so this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Again, Psalms 29, 3 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. And then notice verse 16, his right hand, his nail-scarred hand, his loving, gentle hand, his strong and mighty hand holds seven stars. Seven stars. Think about this for a moment. If, um, if we are false to him, uh, no one can deliver us from his hand. But if we're true to him, no one can take us from his hand. Remember he said in John 10, in my, in my hand and wrapped up in my Father's hand and no one plucks them from my Father's hand. That's security of a blood-bought believer. Ladies and gentlemen, they are, uh, if they are the true to him, that he'll be true to them. The seven stars are the angels. For, let me read verse 19 and 20 uh, before I get ahead of myself. Notice what he said. Write these things which you've seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand are the se and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. You say, well, what is he talking about here? When he's talking about the angels uh, of the churches, the seven angels, Angel means messengers. And so we assume and believe, and I believe it is, the pastors of those churches. He is sending his message from God to the pastors so the pastors can give it to the churches. That's the order of God. And these are messengers to those seven churches. Uh, Psalmist wrote and says, Do not touch my anointed ones. And do not uh, and do my prophets no harm. Remember David when Saul was trying to persecute him and trying to kill him actually and chasing him all over the countryside. And an opportune time came for uh, for David and he had him in his hand. All he had to do is draw his sword and kill him, drive him through, and he would not. Why? He says, "I will not lay my hand against God's anointed." A good lesson for all of us. God's preachers and God's servants are going to be judged by God. And their judgment is going to be more severe than some because they're teaching and preaching the word of God and if they've messed up, God will hold them accountable. But it's not your place or my place to judge those preachers. Do not lay your hand against one of God's anointed. In other words, don't go home on Sunday and have preacher for lunch. You need to uh, respect your preachers. You need to respect those that God has chosen and raised up. You say, well, they're not doing right. God will deal with them. You pray for them. God will deal with them. But you don't lay your hand against God's anointed. These 
are the stars that's held in the hand of Jesus. His mouth went out a two-edged sword. Uh, this represents judgment and justice according to the truth of his word. His countenance was like the sun. Remember at the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop, and there Jesus was transformed before them. And I think it's Luke's gospel that says, and his clothes became white and glittering. In other words, the light beams from his person shine through his garments. And, and it was a blinding light. It was a light brighter than noonday sun. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus and it says about noon, this light came down from heaven that was brighter than the noonday sun. Listen, my folks, God, uh, 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 Jesus, uh, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Uh, and so Revelation tells us in Revelation 21, 23, listen to what he says. And the city had no need of sun or a moon to shine on it in it, for the glory of, the, of God illuminated it. The Lamb is the light of that city. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no need for the sun in heaven. Jesus is the S-U-N, the S-O-N of God. He will shine. Jesus here is presented as a high priest, more as a judgment rather than intercessor here. But, but here he is judging the church in light of their burning lights. Their lights are supposed to be shining. Are they shining brightly in your church? He is interested in what we do with what we have more than what we do or don't do with what we don't have. Notice verse 17 again. And he fell at his feet as dead. This is John who laid on Jesus' breast at supper time, who uh, uh, now is seeing him in a different light in his fullness of his glory and says he fell as dead. Remember Isaiah, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and he fell as a dead man and the spirit had to pick him up. It, it, it's, so, it's so with anyone. Once you see it with Joshua, with the, with the uh, uh, angel of the Lord that appeared to him, uh, Peter and James and John at the transfiguration were falling down. But again, the Lord saying, do not be afraid. This is the most often repeated command in the Bible. Fear not or do not be afraid. 16 times in the New Testament. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment. 1 John 4, 18. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil, the world, our government is trying to put fear and hold down God's people and God's church with fear. And if you're susceptible to fear, listen, why is it that we as Christians who believe we're going to heaven when we die are so afraid of death? It's a ticket to heaven. Don't fear. Put your faith in Christ. And notice again, Jesus is talking uh, uh, and, and, he, and Jesus is, uh, is, is speaking that this is, this is God speaking, you know. Uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He holds the key of Hades and, and death, of death and hell, we say. Uh, in verse 18, and, and he holds the key. Having the keys represents having authority. And, and at the unseen world of the, the, those that are damned, this is, this is where the spirits of the unsaved are held. He has the key to hell. And Hades is a Greek word. And of death, which he broke the power of. The power of death is in his hands. He holds the key. Now the interpretation and the explanation of the vision of the seven lampstands of the seven stars are all given there in verse 20 are a clue that many other things are symbolic in this book. Symbolic, we need interpretation as well. We need to understand what is he talking about. As I said at the beginning, there's 404 verses in the book of Revelation and 283 of them have something to reference back to the Old Testament. You notice I've been quoting a lot of the Old Testament here. 
The mystery is that which must be revealed to be understood. The angels are the messengers to the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We'll continue in chapter 2 as he begins his, uh, his rebuke and his, uh, his praise and everything with uh, the church at Ephesus next time. God bless you and help you, I hope you have a great week and I hope we get to see you this Sunday in church. God bless you. Have a good day.